Hey guys, this is Ryan McLean from PositiveCashflowAustralia.com and today I'm going to be talking about what are the risks when investing in positive cash flow property. So just like any other investment, investing in positive cash flow property does carry with it many risks, but what are the risks and how severe are they? It's important to understand that it's important to understand each and every risk before you go ahead and purchase an investment. So what I've done is I've collected 20 different risks. However, I'm sure that there's some that I've forgotten as well, but this is a good list to get you started. It's important to note while it's impossible, absolutely impossible to avoid all risk, you can prepare yourself against risk. And items such as insurance is a simple way to protect yourself from potential risks such as bad tenants or loss of value of income or devastating occurrences like fires and so forth. So here are 20 risks when investing in positive cash flow property. Although I've tried to focus on positive cash flow property, these risks are generally um, also applicable to negatively geared properties as well. So I've kind of put them into different categories. So the first category is what I call cash flow risks. And so cash flow risks are the risks that could cause you to have out of pocket expenses or difficulty paying your bills in the day to day. Although at the end you may be ahead if you don't manage your cash flow property cash flow properly throughout the year and prepare for these risks, then you could find yourself in a very tricky or very difficult situation when you've got bills to pay and no money lying around to pay for it. So here are nine things that could occur that could put your cash flow at risk. The first one is rental vacancy. So there's always the risk that your property may become vacant and stay vacant for some time. Different areas have different vacancy rates. If there's a lot of renters and not a lot of places for them, then you're unlikely to have vacancies for very long. But if there's an oversupply of properties and not enough people to rent them, then you could have long periods of vacancy. At the end of the day, renters, tend to want the most house for their money and so if your house is overpriced or if it's deteriorated then it can cause your vacancy rates to go up so stay in tune with the market and do your best to offer them suitable property at an attractive price to try and avoid those rental vacancies. Number two is management problems. It's pretty rare, but you could have a circumstance where you're having problems with your rental manager. Happened to one of my friends who they just didn't find that the rental manager was doing a very good job, getting them enough rent, following up, getting the rent paid on time and so forth. And it was causing cash flow issues. So most real estate agents put a clause in their contract saying you need to give them about three or sometimes even six months before terminating a contract with them. This is crazy. This is mayhem. If you knew that you were getting fired from your job in three months' time, would you work hard? I mean, would you work your ass off to ensure that you did the best you could for that employer knowing that you're going to be ditched in three months time. Of course not. You're not going to work hard for them. So a way to avoid this is to get that clause removed from the contract um, and ensure that you check their references before hiring them. Risk number three is your tenants not paying rent. So believe it or not, but some tenants Some tenants pay rent late or they don't pay it at all and late rent or no rent will throw a spanner in the works because it means that that you've got a loss of income that you'll have to pay with out of your own pocket. Sure, insurance can protect you if the people run away and you can't get the money but there's always going to be a delay between um, when the insurance arrives and the bills that you have to pay. So you need to take that sort of stuff into account. Number four is your unexpected maintenance maintenance bills. So a story of me, uh, my mum had purchased an, an investment property unit that eventually she wanted to live in. And so me and my wife moved into that property. And as soon as we moved in, basically within a week or two, the hot water system broke. So she then had to replace that at the cost of 500 to to $1,000. She then decided after a couple of months of living there that she wanted to buy another property closer to the beach. And so she sold that one. And me and my wife and um, my kids at the time moved into that new new property. Now, because it was a new property, not brand new, like an older property, uh, we moved in and the exact same thing happened again. The hot water system was already busted before we even got there. Uh, Brown water. So she had to ditch out another 500 or a thousand dollars on that. So there's always going to be unexpected maintenance bills. So you need to take those sorts of things into account. 
You've also got your rent value decline, which is number five. So it doesn't happen all that often, but it is possible for rents to go down in an area. And this is usually caused by an oversupply of housing or people leaving the area due to lack of employment. Um, so would you be able to afford your property if it dropped $50 a week in rent? Um, it's just a good thing to think about. Cash flow risk number six is interest rates increasing. So interest rates are some of the lowest we've seen in 20 years. I hear some people say they're going to go down again. Some people say they're going to go up. You know, it depends on exports and depends on all these other things. Um, but it is good to prepare for interest rates rising and build that into your cash flow predictions um, so you can afford it if interest rates do go up. Uh, Risk number seven, which I hope never happens to you, is lenders calling in your loan. I pray that this never happens to you, but if it does occur, um, you know, it's it's unpredictable. You can't know why it's going to occur. But what it means is that uh, the lender is asking you to pay back the loan in full before it's agreed upon due date. So rather than the 25 years of your loan, you know, they're asking you to pay it back within the next eight weeks. Uh, Usually the only way to mitigate this risk is to find another lender you can borrow from. Otherwise, you've got to sell the property uh, to liquefy and to pay off your debt. So let's hope that never happens. Number eight is insurance payment delays. So we talked about vacancies and tenants who don't pay, but there's also a case of damage to the property. It might be malicious and need to get fixed. It might be devastating damage like a fire. In each of these cases, you're going to have to pay extra money to repair damages over the bond that the tenant has left um, or you're going to be losing cash flow because you know if it's, if it's burnt down, no one's going to be living in it. And so you need to consider this cash flow risk and the potential that insurance may be delayed sometime before you get that money. Number nine and the last one in our cash flow risk is just general cash flow issues. So this is, I guess what you put on your budget as miscellaneous, you know, when you're sitting down at on nine o'clock on a Tuesday night with your wife, you don't necessarily think in your budget that you need to budget hundred dollars for the upcoming weekend because you have a buck. So you want to go out drinking with your friends and the same goes for property. There's a lot of things that you can't think of when you're sitting down and doing it. So you need to have that miscellaneous sort of thing in there. So after cash flow risk, we're going to look at damage risks. Okay, so these are the risks of damage being done to the property. It's going to be pretty hard if you own shares to set your shares on fire um, and your bank deposit's not likely to get damaged in a flood. Okay, but with property, all these things are possible, albeit it's, you know, a small chance of it happening, it does happen. So I just want to cover off the two major damage risks that I could think of. So number what's number 10 is malicious damage. And so this is when your tenant or an outside intruder decides to damage your property. It can be intentional or it can be unintentional, but they just take horrible care of the property. And regardless, the damage needs to be fixed. You've got a bond, but it might cost you more than the bond. And so that's where insurance comes in. But if you don't have insurance, well then, you know, that's that's an even bigger risk for you. And then number 11, you've got that fire and other devastation. So more serious risk, bushfires, floods, um, I don't know, sinkholes, mudslides, whatever, you know, all those sorts of things. Next, I want to look at um, what I'm calling capital risks. So capital risks are risks that could affect the value of your property. So there's five capital risks that you need to consider when investing in positively geared property. So number 12, we've got the loss of value of the property. And so here we're just talking about market fluctuations and, you know, the market going down, even though people say property tends to rise and double every seven to 10 years, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily happen on a consistent basis. We have, you know, big peaks and booms, and then we have times where property prices actually go backwards. So you need to consider that. I had a time when I was living back when I was a kid, the next door neighbors, it was during the pro- a property boom and they bought the property for $750,000. And then a year later, they decided they wanted to move to a quieter street. And so they sold that property to buy another property and they sold it for $650,000. So in one year, that property went down $100,000. So important thing to think of. Number 13 is your major repair costs. So things like needing a new roof is going to cost you a lot of money and it's generally not necessarily something you can do out of spare cash. A lot of people tend to take equity loans on stuff like this to do repairs but if you don't have any equity in your property then being able to do these things are going to become pretty hard. 
Number 14 is your difficulty in selling. So there's always the risk that a property may be difficult to sell. In some rural areas, it's normal for a property to sit on the market for 200 days, even up to a year to actually sell the property. So the best way to ensure a faster than average sale is to buy a property that appeals to the largest amount of people. For example, in the Positive Cashflow Academy that I run, we did an analysis on a town and we saw that the majority of people living in that town were living in three and four bedroom houses. So if you owned a one bedroom house, then there was a very small amount of people actually living in one bedroom houses, which means your chances of selling that quickly are probably smaller because less people want to buy it. More people want to buy in the three and four bedroom bracket than the one bedroom bracket. So definitely difficulty to sell is something that you need to think of. Number 15 is expensive to sell. Um, Properties can be expensive to sell. You know, real estate commissions usually hover somewhere around the 2% mark. So for a $500,000 house, that's 25 grand that you're going to have to pay just to the agent to sell it, not in counting like all the fees and solicitors and all that sort of stuff as well. So you need to take all of that into account. And then the other capital risk is number 16, which is the fact that because property is so expensive, it's likely that you're going to have little diversification, especially when you're getting started. So because you're putting all of your eggs in one basket to be able to afford to buy the property, um, it leaves you little diversification if something was to go wrong. And so the last thing that I want to look at is what I'm calling opportunity risk. Risks. And so opportunity risks are risks that you could be doing something better with the money that you're investing in this property. So it may or may not occur, but if you have money invested in property, then that means you've got money that you're not investing somewhere else. So you're always taking that opportunity risk. Uh, So there's four opportunity risks that you need to consider when investing in real estate and positive cash flow property. So we're up to number 17. And so that's property not helping you achieve your financial goals. See, I get a lot of emails. I love it when I get emails. I love getting questions in the emails because I write blog posts about the questions you guys send me. If you want to send an email, shoot it off to ryan at positivecashflowaustralia.com. Shoot me an email. Let me know how you're going. Say hello. Ask me a question, whatever. Um, But I get a lot of emails from people saying, you know, I found a property. Is this a good property to invest in? Or I found this area where there seems to be positive cash flow properties. Should I, um, is it a good investment? And my response is almost always the same. And I say a good investment for who? You know, the biggest mistake new investors make is that they just want to invest in something. They want to put their money into something. They want to make money. Um, And my parents did this. I remember when they bought a small one bedroom uh, unit in right near where they lived, um, because they just wanted to invest in property. But the property, you know, it was negatively geared. It hardly went up in value. They ended up selling it in five years' time. But really, they only made back the money that they had poured into the property. So they didn't actually end up walking away with a profit at the end of that five years. So it wasn't moving them towards their financial goals. So it's important to understand if a property is moving you towards your financial goals. And in the Positive Cashflow Academy, we talk in more detail about understanding how to analyze property based on your own financial goals. So number 18 is an opportunity risk is the fact that you don't have any access to cash in a flash. So bank deposits, shares, they're fairly liquid. You know, you can liquidate them, move your money elsewhere. Um, If you need to get cash, you can get it pretty quickly. Um, But when it comes to property, it can be much more difficult to access your cash. You could get an equity loan, um, but if you don't have enough equity and, you know, you still got to wait for the valuations and stuff like that, if you don't have enough equity, then you're not going to be pull, be able to pull any money out. And if you want to sell your property, well, depending on the area, it could take a long time to sell. And even if you sell it straight away, you know, you could have a six-week settlement. And so your property is not going to be as liquid as investing in, you know, other other assets. Number That leads us into number 19, which is it's difficult to access equity. So if you own a $500,000 house and you have a $350,000 mortgage, well, effectively, you've got $150,000 in equity or untapped value of that property. However, in most cases, you can actually only borrow up to $400,000 or 80% of the value of the property if you if you want to avoid being stung with things like lender's mortgage insurance. So even, um, even though you can you probably assess that access that $50,000, you know, there's $100,000 that you can't necessarily tap if you want to keep that asset, you need to leave it in there. You can only get it if you sell it. 
And so number 20, lucky last, thanks for hanging in there, guys, is the high entry costs of buying and property. And that's definitely an opportunity risk because you know, on a $500,000 house, you're talking about a minimum of 25 grand, or if you want a 20% deposit, $100,000 plus your closing costs as well. So I don't know, but um, I could probably count on, you know, one, one hand, the amount of people that have that sort of cash lying around. I'm young, I'm in my 20s, you know, a lot of us don't have that sort of money lying around that we can just throw into an investment. Um, you know, one of my friends just got funding for $1.7 million uh, for a startup company. Um, he would be one of the people <laughs> that I would know that would have access to that sort of money, but not necessarily for himself, for the company that that he started. Um, and one extra risk that I just want to touch on is litigation. So there's always the risk of being sued and it could come from almost anyone. It could be a tenant suing you for the fact that a certain part of your property isn't within regulation or they hurt themselves or it could be litigation outside of your property, things like divorce and stuff like that. So protecting yourself against litigation is important. I don't um, I don't talk in detail about this because I'm not a tax accountant or anything, but Divna Boholt has a book called Protect Your Assets, uh, which is very good. And so if you go to, um, what is it, pca.im, which is my short link, pca.im forward slash assets, then that will redirect you to Dimfner's book, which you can buy through um, an Australian online bookstore and it just gets shipped out to you. So if that's something you're interested in, check that out. Oh, okay, so I covered 20 risks. Well, actually 21. It's important to understand that you can protect yourself against a lot of these or most of these risks. And so for every investment, there's going to be risks. You know, it's up to you to assess what risk you're willing to take for the reward you think you're going to get. As Dave Ramsey says, if you want to live like no one else, um, he says, actually, if you live like no one else, then later you can live like no one else. So living the life of your dreams does involve taking risks, um, but you need to be wise about that. So this is Ryan from PositiveCashflowAustralia.com, and I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast episode.